Over sea, under stone. Day one, part two. They emerge from the little dark corridor. Its door, as they close it behind them, vanishing once more into the shadows, so that they can hardly see where it had been. Not much else here. That one's Great Uncle Mary's bedroom. There's the bathroom, this side of it, and Mother's studio room, the other. What an odd way this house was built, Simon said, as they turned into another narrow corridor towards the stairs leading up to the next floor. All little bits joined together by funny little passages, as if each bit were meant to keep to be kept secret from the next. Barney looked round him in the dim light, tapping at the half panel walls. It's all very solid. There ought to be secret panels and things, secret entrances into native treasure caves. Well, we haven't finished yet. Simon led the way up the stairs to the familiar top landing where the bedrooms were. Isn't it getting dark? I suppose it's the low clouds. Barney squatted on the top stair. We ought to have torches, burning brands to light the path and keep the wild animals off. Only we couldn't because there are hostile natives all around, and they'd see. Simon took over. Somehow, imagination worked easily in the friendly silence of the gray house. Actually, they're already after us, creeping along our tracks up the hill. We'll be able to hear their feet rustling soon. We ought to hide. Make camp somewhere that they can't get at. In one of the bedrooms, they're all caves. I can hear them breathing, Barney said, gazing down the dark stairs into the shadow. He was half beginning to believe it. The obvious caves wouldn't do, Simon said, remembering the remembering he was in command. They'd looked there first of all. He crossed the landing and began thoughtfully opening and shutting doors. Mother's and father's room, no good. Very ordinary cave. Jane's, just the same. Bathroom, our room, no escape route, anywhere. We shall all be turned into sacrifices and eaten. Boiled, said Barney, <coughs> separately, in a great big pot. Perhaps there's another door, I mean cave, that we haven't noticed. Like the one downstairs. Jane peered round the darkest end of the landing beside her brother's door. But the passage came to a dead end, the wall running unbroken round all three sides. There ought to be one. After all, the house goes straight up, doesn't it? And there's a door directly underneath there. She pointed at the blank wall, and a room behind it. So there ought to be a room the same size behind this wall. Simon became interested. You're quite right, but there isn't any door. Perhaps there's a secret panel, Barney said hopefully. You read too many books. Have you ever seen a real secret panel in a real house? Anyway, there isn't any paneling on this wall, just wallpaper. Your room's on the other side, James said. Is there a door in there? Simon shook his head. Barney opened the door into the bedroom and went in, kicking his slippers under the bed as he went past. Then he stopped suddenly. Hey, come in here. What's the matter? That bed between our beds, where the wall makes a sort of alcove for the wardrobe. What's on the other side? Well, the landing, of course. It can't be. There's too much wall in, the, in here. You stand in the doorway and look on both sides. The landing stops before it gets that far. I'll bang on the wall where it does stop, and you listen in here, said Jane. She went outside, pulling the door shut, then, and they heard a faint tapping sound on the wall just over the head of Barney's bed. There you are, Barney said, hopping with excitement. The landing only reaches to there, but the wall in here goes on for yards, right over your bed to the window, so there must be a room on the other side. Jane came back into the bedroom. The wall doesn't look nearly as long out there as it does in here. It isn't. And I think that means, Simon said slowly, that there must be a door behind the wardrobe. Well, that finishes it then, Jane said, disappointed. That wardrobe's enormous. We shall never be able to move it. I don't see why not, Simon looked thoughtfully at the wardrobe. We shall have to pull it from down low so the top doesn't overbalance. If we all pull at one end, perhaps it'll swing round. Come on then, Jane said. Jane said. You and I pull, and Barney hold the top and shout if he feels it overbalancing. They both bent and heaved at the nearest leg of the wardrobe. Nothing happened. I think the stupid thing's nailed to the floor, said Jane in disgust. No, it's not. Come on, once more. One, two, three, heave. The great wooden tower squeaked unwillingly a few inches across the floor. Go on, go on, it's coming. Barney could hardly stand still. Simon and Jane tugged and puffed and blew their sneakers, slithering on the linoleum and Gradually, the wardrobe moved out at an angle from the wall. Barney, peering into the gloom behind, suddenly shrieked, There it is! There is a door! Oof! He staggered backwards, gasped and sneezed. It's all covered in dust and cobwebs. It can't have been open for years. Well, go on, try it, panted Simon, pink with breathlessness and success. I hope it doesn't open towards us, Jane said, sitting weakly on the floor. I can't pull this thing another inch. It doesn't, Barney said, muffled from behind the wardrobe. They heard the door creak protestingly open. Then he reappeared with a dark, large, dark smudge down one cheek. There isn't a room. It's a staircase. More like a ladder, really. It goes up to a sort of hatchway, and there's light up there. He looked at Simon with a crooked grin. 
You can go first, boss. One by one, they slipped behind the wardrobe and through the little hidden door. Inside it, it was a, at first very dark, and Simon, blinking, saw before him a wide step ladder, steep, steeply slanting, rising towards a dimly lit square beyond which he could see nothing. The steps were thick with dust, and for a moment he felt very felt nervous about disturbing the stillness. Then, very faintly, he heard above his head the low, familiar murmur of the sea outside. At once, the comfortable noise made him more cheerful, and he even remembered what they were supposed to be. Last one up, shut the door, he called down over his shoulders, keep the natives at bay, and he began to climb the ladder. Chapter 3. As Simon, Simon's head emerged from, or emerged through the hatch at the top, he caught his breath just as Barney had, aha, and sneezed enormously. Clouds of dust rose and the ladder shook. Hey, said Barney protestingly from below, drawing his face back from his brother's twitching heels. Simon opened his watering eyes and blinked. Before him and all around was one vast attic the length and breadth of the whole house, with two grubby windows in its sloping roof. It was piled higgedly, piggedly, with the most fantastic collection of objects he had ever seen. Boxes, chests, and trunks lay everywhere, with mounds of dirty gray canvas and rough coiled ropes between them, stacks of newspapers and magazines, yellow-brown with age, a brass bedstead and a grandfather clock without a face. And he stared. He saw smaller things, a broken fishing rod, a straw hat perched on the corner of an oil painting dark darkening by age into one great black blur, an empty mousetrap, a ship in a bottle, a glass-fronted case full of chunks of rock, a pair of old thigh boots flopped over sideways as if they were tired, a cluster of battered pewter mugs. Gosh, said Simon. Muffled noises of protest came from below, and he hauled himself out through the opening and rolled sideways out of their way on the floor. Barney and Jane came through after him. Simon, said Jane, Jane gazing at him in horror, you're filthy. Well, isn't that just like a girl? All this round you, and you only see a bit of dust. It'll brush off, he patted ineffectually at his piebald shirt. But isn't it marvelous? Look, Barney, cooling with delight, was picking his way across the littered floor. There's an old ship's wheel, a rocking chair, and a saddle. I wonder if the captain ever had a horse. Jane had been trying to look insulted, but failed. This is something like exploring. We might find anything up here. It's a treasure cave. This is what the natives were after. Hear them howling with frustrated rage down there, dancing around in a circle with the witch doctor cursing us all. Well, he can curse away, Barney said cheerfully. We've got enough provisions for ages. I'm hungry. Oh, not yet. You can't be. It's only four o'clock. Well, that's tea time. Anyway, when you're on the run, you eat little and often because you don't ever stop for long. If we were Eskimos, we'd be chewing an old shoelace. My book says, never mind your book, Simon said. He fit, fished inside the rucksack. Here, have an apple and keep quiet. I want to look at everything properly before we have our picnic, and if I can wait, so can you. I don't see why, Barney said, but he bit into his apple cheerfully and wandered across the floor, disappearing between the high brass skeleton of the old bed and an empty cupboard. For half an hour they poked about in a happy, dusty dream, through the junk and broken furniture and ornaments. It was like reading the story of somebody's life, Jane thought, as she gazed at the tiny matchstick mass of the, mat of the ship sailing motionless forever in the green glass bottle. All these things ha had been used once, had been part of every day in the house below. Someone had slept on the bed, anxiously watched the minutes on the clock, pounced joyfully on each magazine as it arrived, but all those people were long dead or gone away, and now the oddments of their lives were piled up here, forgotten. She found herself feeling rather sad. It's I'm ravenous, Barney said plaintively. I'm thirsty. It's all that dust. Come on, let's unload Miss Pock's tea. This attic's rather a swizz, Simon said, squatting on the crackling edge of canvas and undoing the rucksack. All the really interesting boxes are locked. Look at that one, for instance. He nodded towards a black metal chest with two rustling paddock padlocks on its lid. I bet it's full of the family jewels. Well, Jane said regretfully, we aren't supposed to touch anything locked, are we? There's a lot not locked, Simon said, handing her the bottle of blue lemonade. Here. You'll have to swig from the bottle. We forgot to bring any cups. Don't worry, we won't pinch anything. Though I shouldn't think anyone's been up here for years. Food, Barney said. The scones are in that bag there. Help yourself. Four each. I've counted. Barney reached out an extremely dirty hand. Barney, Jane squeaked. Wipe your hand. You'll eat all sorts of germs and get typhoid or rabies or something. Here, have my handkerchief. Rabies is mad dogs, Barney said, looking with interest at the black fin fingerprints on his scone anyway. Father says people make too much fuss about germs. All right, Jane, stop waving that silly thing at me. I've got a proper handkerchief of my own. I don't know how girls ever blow their noses. 
scowling, he thrust his free hand into his pocket, and then, then his expression changed to disgust. Ugh, he said, and brought out a brown squashed apple core. I'd forgotten that. All cold and horrible. He flung the core away from him into the far corner of the attic. It bounced, slithered, and rolled into the shadows. Simon grinned. Now you bring the rats out. All attics have rats. We shall hear greedy little squeakings and see twin green points of fire, and there'll be rats all over the floor. First they'll eat the green apple core, and then they'll come after us. Jane turned pale. Oh no, there wouldn't be rats up here, would there? If there were, they'd have eaten all the newspaper, Barney said hopefully. Wouldn't they? I expect they don't like ink. All old houses have rats. We got them at school. You can hear them scuttling about on the roof sometimes. Come to think of it, their eyes are red, not green. Simon's voice began to lose its brightness. He was beginning to feel slightly unhappy about the rats themselves now. I think maybe you'd better pick that apple core up, you know, just in case. Barney gave an exaggerated sigh and got to his feet, swallowing his scone in two gigantic bites. Where did it go, then? Over there somewhere? I wonder why they didn't put anything in this corner. He crawled about on his hands and knees aimlessly. Come and help, I can't find it. Then he noticed a triangular gap in the sloping wall of the attic where its planks joined the floor. He peered through and saw daylight gleaming dimly through the tiles. Just inside the gap, the floorboards ended, and he could feel wide-spaced beams. I think I must have gone through this hole, he called. I'm going to look. Jane dived across the floor towards him. Oh, do be careful. There might be a rat. Couldn't be, Barney said halfway through the gap. There's light coming through the tiles, and I can see more or less. Can't see any core, though. I wonder if it fell between the floorboards and underneath and the underneath part. Ow! His rear half jerked suddenly. What is it? Oh, do come out, Jane tugged at his shorts. I touched something, but it can't be a rat. It didn't move. Where's it gone? Here it is. Feels like cardboard. Blah. Here's that disgusting core next to it as well. His voice grew suddenly louder as he backed out of the hole, flushed and blinking. Well, there it is, he said, triumphantly flourishing the apple core. Now the rats will have to come and get it. I still don't believe there are any. What's that other thing you've got? Simon looked curiously at a tattered scroll like object in Barney's other hand. Piece of wallpaper, I think. Bet you've eaten all the scones, you pigs. Barney bounded back across the floor, making the floorboards rattle. He sat down, pulled out his handkerchief, waved it out unsustainously at Jane, wiped his hands, and began <clears throat> to munch another scone. As they ate, he reached over and idly unrolled the scroll he had found, holding one end on the floor and his toe and pushing with his toe and pushing the other back with the piece of wood until it lay stretched open before them. And then, as they saw what it was, they all suddenly forgot their eating and stared. The paper Barney had unrolled was not a paper at all, but a kind of thickest brownish, or thick brownish parchment, springy as steel, with long raised cracks crossing it, where it had been rolled. Inside it, another sheet was stuck down, darker, looking much older, ragged at the edges, and covered with small writing and strange, squashed-looking, dark brown letters. Before the writing, it, before the writing, it dwindled as if it had been signed by some great heat long ago into half-detached pieces carefully laid back together and stuck toward the other sheet. But there was enough of it left for them to see at the bottom a rough drawing that looked like the uncertain outline of a map. For a moment they were all very quiet. Barney said nothing, but he could feel a strange excitement bubbling up inside him. He leaned forward in silence and carefully stretched the manuscript flat, pushing the piece of wood aside. Here, Simon said, I'll get something to weight the edges down. They put an old paper weight, a pewter mug, and two carefully dusted chunks of wood on the corners and sat back on their heels to look. It's terribly old, Jane said. Centuries, thousands of years. Like those papers and glass cases in museums with little curtains to keep the light out. Where did it come from? How did it get up here? Somebody must have hidden it. But it's older than the house. I mean, look at it. It must be. Some of the writings nearly faded away. It wasn't hidden, Barney said with absolute conviction, though he had no clear idea why. Someone just threw it down there where I found it. Simon whooped suddenly, making them jump. This is terrific. Do you realize we've got a real-life treasure map? It could lead us to anything, anywhere. Secret passages, real hidden caves, the treasure of Truisic. He rolled the words lovingly round his tongue. There isn't much map. It's all writing. Well, then, that's instructions. Look in your little room on the second floor, I expect it says. Your second floorboard on the, mean, I mean, your left. When this was written, there weren't such things as floorboards. Oh, come off it. It's not that old. I bet it is, Barney said quietly. Anyway, you look at this writing. You can't read it. It's all in some funny language. Of course you can read it if you look properly, Simon said impatiently. In his mind, he was already halfway through a sliding panel. 
throwing back the lid of the chest to reveal hordes of untold wealth. You can almost hear the chink of the Dublins. Let's have a look. He leaned forward, the floorboards hard and rough under his knees, and peered at the manuscript. There was a long pause. Oh, he said at last, reluctantly. Barney said nothing, but looked at him very expressively indeed. Well, all right, said Simon. There's no need to look so cocky. It isn't in English. But that doesn't mean we shan't be able to find out what it says. Why isn't it in English? How on earth should I know? I mean, Barney said patiently, that we're in England, so what other language could it possibly be in? Latin, Jane, Jane said unexpectedly. She had been looking quietly at the manuscript over Simon's shoulder. Latin? Yes, all old manuscripts are written in Latin. The monks used them used to write them down with a goose feather for a pen. They put flowers and birds and things all squiggling around the capital letters. There isn't anything squiggling here. It looks as if it's been written in a rather hurry. I can't even see any capital letters at all. But why Latin? demanded Barney. I don't know. The monks just always used it, that's all. It was one of their things, I suppose. It's a religious-sounding kind of language. Well, Simon does Latin. Yes, come on, Simon translate it, Jane said maliciously. At school, she had not yet begun Latin, but he had been learning it for two years and was rather superior about, superior about the fact. I don't think it's Latin at all, Simon said rebelliously. He peered at the manuscript again. This writing's so odd. The letters all look the same, like a lot of little straight lines all in a row. The light in here isn't very good either. You're just making excuses. No, I'm not. It's jolly difficult. Well, if you can't even recognize Latin when you see it, you can't be nearly as good as you make out. Have another look, said Barney, hopefully. I think it's in two parts, Simon says slowly. One little paragraph on top, and then a lot more altogether after a gap. The second bit, I can't make out at all, but the first paragraph does look as if it might be in Latin. The first word looks like cum. That means with. But I can't see what comes after it. Then later, there's post motos anos. That's after many years. But the writing's also small and squashy. I can't, wait a minute. There's some names in the last line. It says, Mar, no, Marco Atoroch. Like Marco Polo, said Jane, doubtfully. What a funny name. Not one name, it's two. Q means and, only they put it on the end instead of in the middle. And O on the end is the ablative of us. So this means by with or from Marcus and Arturus. By with or from. What a... Uh, Barney, whatever's the matter? Barney, red in the face and spluttering, had suddenly thumped his fist on the floor, caught his breath trying to say something, and collapsed into a thunderous fit of coughing. They patted him on the back and gave him a drink of lemonade. Marcus and Arturus he said hoarsely, gulping his breath. Don't you see? It's Mark and Arthur. It's about King Arthur and his knights. Mark was one of them, and he was King of Cornwall. It must be about them. Gosh, Simon said. I think he's right. It must be that. I bet old King Mark left some treasure behind somewhere, and that's why there's a map. Suppose we find it. We'd be rich. We'd be famous. We shall have to tell mother and father, Jane said. The two boys stopped thumping each other ecstatically and looked at her. Whatever for? Well, Jane said lamely, taken aback, I suppose we ought to, that's all. Barney sat back on his heels again, frowning, and riffled his fingers through his hair, which by now looked several shades darker than they had when they came up to the attic. I wonder what they'd say. I know what they'd say, Simon said promptly. They'd say it was all our imagination, and anyway, they'd tell us to put the manuscript back where we found it, because it isn't ours. Well, said Jane, it isn't, is it? It's a treasure trove. Finders, findings, keepings. But we found it in someone else's house. It belongs to the captain. You know what mother said about not touching anything. She said anything that, that was put away. This wasn't put away. It was just chucked down in a corner. I found it, Barney said. It was all forgotten and dusty. I bet you anything the captain hadn't a clue it was there. Oh, honestly, Jane, Simon said. You can't find a treasure map and just say, oh, how nice, and put it back again. That's what they'd make us do. Oh, well, Jane said doubtfully. I suppose you're right. We can always put it back afterwards. Barney had turned to the manuscript again. Hey, he said, look at this top part, the old manuscript that's stuck down on the parchment. What's it made of? I thought it was parchment like the outside bit, but when you look properly, it isn't. And it's not paper either. It's some funny thick stuff. And it's hard, like wood. He touched an edge of the strange brown surface gingerly with one finger. Be careful, Jane said nervously. 
and might crumble away into dust before our eyes or something. I suppose you'd still want to go showing everyone even then, Simon said acidly. Look what we've found. Does it matter if we touch it and show them a little heap of dust in a matchbox? Jane said nothing. Oh, well, never mind, Simon said, relenting. She meant very well, after all. Hey, it's getting awfully dark up here. Do you think we'd ought to go down? They'll be looking for us soon. Mother will have stopped painting. It is getting late, Jane looked around the attic and shivered suddenly. The big echoing room was growing dark, and there was a dismal sound now to the rain faintly tapping on the glass. Back in their bedrooms, the boys' wardrobe pushed in again to hide the small secret door. They washed and changed hurriedly as the curt clang of the ship's bell calling them to supper, echoed up the stairs. Simon changed his dusty shirt, rolling a clean one into a crumpled ball before he put it on, and hoped no one would notice it was fresh. There was not very much they could do about Barty's hair, now khaki. It's like what Mother says about the rug in the living room at home, Jane said in despair, trying to brush out the dust while her brother wriggled in protest. It shows every mark. Perhaps we ought to wash it, Simon peered at Barney critically. No, Barney said. Oh, well, there isn't time, really. Anyway, I'm hungry. You'll just have to sit away from the light. But when they were all sitting around the supper table, it soon became clear that no one was going to ask questions about where they had been. The evening began as one of those times when everything seemed determined to go wrong. Mother looked tired and depressed and did not say very much. Signs they knew that her day's painting had not been a success. Father, gloomy after the gray day, erupted into wrath when Rufus bounced in dripping from his walk and banished him to the kitchen with Miss, Mrs. Hawk. And Great Uncle Mary had come in silent and thoughtful, mysteriously brooding. He sat at one end of the table alone, staring into the middle distance like a great carved totem pole. The children eyed him wearily, or wary, wearily and took care to pass him the salt before he had to ask. But Great Uncle Mary scarcely seemed to see them. He ate automatically, picking up his food and guiding it to his mouth without taking the slightest notice of it. Barney wondered for a wistful moment what would happen if he were to slip a cork table mat onto his great uncle's plate. Mrs. Pot came in with an enormous apple tart and a dish of mounded yellow cream and clattered the dirty plates into a pile. She went out down the hall and they heard the rich rolling contralto of Oh God, Our Health and Ages Past echoing into the distance. Father sighed. There are times, he said irritably, when I could dispense with devotions at every meal. The Cornish, boomed great uncle Mary from the shadows, are devout and evangelical people. I dare say, said Father. He passed Simon the cream. Simon helped himself to a large spoonful and a yellow blob dropped from the spoon to the tablecloth. Oh, Simon, Mother said. Do you do look what you're doing. I couldn't help it. It just fell. That comes of trying to take too much at once, Father said. Well, you like it too, possibly, but I don't try to transport a quart in a pint pot. What do you mean? Never mind, Father said. Oh, for heaven's sake, Simon. That's just making it worse. Simon, in an attempt to retrieve the blob of cream with a spoon, had left a large yellow smear on the cloth. Sorry. I should think so. Did you go fishing today, Father? Jane said hopefully from across the table, feeling that it was time to change the subject. No, said Father. Don't be stupid, Simon said ungratefully, still smarting. It was raining. Well, Father does go fishing in the rain sometimes. No, he doesn't. Yes, he does. If I may be allowed to explain my own actions, Father said with heavy sarcasm. Occasionally I have been known to go fishing in the rain. Today I did not. Is that comprehensible? Have some apple tart, dear, said Mother, handing him a plate. Mmm, Father said, glancing at her sideways, and he laughed in the silence. After a moment, he said, hopefully, might be an idea if we all went for a walk after supper. It seems to be clearing up. Everyone looked out of the window, and the temperature of the room rose several degrees. Over the sea, the clouds had broken, leaving a deepening blue sky, and the opposite headland glowed suddenly a brighter green as the sinking sun shone for the first time that day. Then they heard the doorbell ring. Father, Mother said wearily, whoever can that be? Mrs. Pock's footsteps rang briskly past the door and then back again. She put her head in. Tis some people for you, Dr. Drew. Stand by to repel boarders, Father said, and he went out into the hall. In a few moments he was back, talking to someone over his shoulder as he came through the door. Very kind of you indeed. We hadn't really thought what we were going to do tomorrow. <clears throat> they're, they are an independent lot, you know. Well, here we, here we are. He beamed heartily round with what the family called his public face. My wife, Simon, Jane, Barney, this is Mr. and Miss er, Withers. From that yacht you admire so much, Simon. We met in the harbor this morning. A man and a girl stood behind him in a doorway. In the doorway, both were dark-haired, with beaming smiles, bright and suntan faces. They looked like beings suddenly 
materialized from another very tidy planet. The man stepped forward, holding out his hand. How do you do, Mrs. Drew? They sat staring blankly at him as he advanced towards Mother. He wore dazzling white flannel trouser, trousers in a blazer with a dark blue scarf tucked in the neck of his white shirt, and they had not expected to see anything like him in Tewisic at all. Then they jumped up hastily as Mother stood to shake hands and Simon knocked over his chair. Into the confusion, Mrs. Pock appeared with a large teapot and a tray of cups and saucers. Two extra cups, she said, smiling blandly, and departed again. Do sit down, the girl said. We only popped in for a moment. We didn't want to interrupt. She bent to help Simon pick up his chair. Her black curls bobbed forward over her forehead. She was a very pretty girl, Jane thought, watching her. Much older than any of them, of course, she wore a bright green shirt and black trousers, and her eyes seemed to twinkle with a kind of hidden private laughter. Jane suddenly felt extremely young. Mr. Withers, showing a lot of very white teeth, was talking to Mother. Mrs. Drew, do, you, do please forgive this intrusion, but we had no intention of breaking into your supper. Not at all, said Mother, looking faintly bemused. Won't you have a cup of tea? Thank you. No, no, most kind, but we have a meal waiting on the boat. We simply came to issue an invitation. My sister and I are in Tuisic for some days, with the yacht to ourselves, on our way round the coast, you know, and we wondered whether you and the children would care to spend a day out at sea. We have, gosh, Simon nearly upset his chair. How marvelous. You mean to go out in that fabulous boat? I do indeed, said the smiling Mr. Withers. Simon spluttered without words his face glowing with delight. <clears throat> Mother said hesitantly, Well, of course I realize we're descending on you out of the blue, Mr. Withers said soothingly, but it would be pleasant to have company for a change, and when we met your husband in the harbor master's office this morning and discovered we are neighbors in London. Are you? said Barney curiously from the table. Where? <clears throat> Marivon High Street, just round the corner from you, said the girl, dimpling at him. Norman sells antiques. She looked across at Mother. I expect you and I use the same shops, this is true. You know, the little pataziri <clears throat> where you can get those gorgeous rum babas? I try not to, Mother said, beginning to smile. Well, really, this is very kind, considering we're strangers. But I'm not sure whether, well, the three of them can be rather a handful, you know. Mother, Simon looked aghast. <clears throat> Mr. Withers pluckered, or puckered his nose boyishly at her. My invitation extends to the whole family, Mrs. Drew. We sincerely hope you and your husband will join our little crew as well. Just a trip out and back, you understand, round the bay, as the commercial gentlemen have it, with a, perhaps a little fishing. I shall enjoy showing off the boat. Tomorrow, perhaps? They say it should be a fine day. What an old-fashioned way of talking he has, Jane thought idly. Perhaps it comes of selling antiques. She looked at Simon and Barney, both all eagerness, and at the at the idea of a day at the on the strange yacht, gazing anxiously at their parents, and then back at Mr. Withers, immaculate white flannels and folded scarf. I don't like him, she thought. I wonder why. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mother said finally. I don't think I shall come, if you'll forgive me. If the sun comes out, I shall go and work up above the harbor. But I, but I know Dick and the children would love to go. Ah, oh, yes, Dr. Drew was telling us about your painting, Mr. Withers said warmly. Well, the loss will be ours, but if the muse calls, dear lady... The rest of the family will come, though, I hope. Not half, said Simon swiftly. It sounds smashing, Barney said. He added as an afterthought. Thank you very much. Well, said Father cheerfully, this is a noble gesture, I must say. We are all very grateful to you, as a matter of fact. He looked vaguely around the room. There should have been one other member of the family here, but he seems to have disappeared. My wife's uncle. He rented the house for us. The children automatically followed his gaze around the room. They had forgotten Great Uncle Mary. Now they realized that there had been no sign of him since the two sudden visitors appeared. The door had, that led into the breakfast room at the back of the house stood slightly open. But when Barney ran across to look in, there was no one there. Professor Lyon, you mean, the girl said. That's right, Father stared at her for a moment. I didn't think I'd mention, mentioned him this morning. Do you know him then? Mr. Withers answered for her quickly and smoothly. I believe we have met once or twice in another sphere than this. In the course of our work, you know, a charming old gentleman, as I remember, but a little unpredictable. That he certainly is, Mother said ruefully, always dashing off somewhere. He hasn't even finished his supper this time, but do let me give you some tea or coffee. Thank you, but I think we should be getting back, the girl said. Vane will be have, will have supper waiting. Mr. Withers pulled down the edges of his in immaculate blazer with a precise feminine gesture. You're quite right, Polly. We mustn't be late. 
He swung his white smile around the room like a lighthouse. Vane is our skipper, the professional on board, and an excellent chef, too. You must sample his cooking tomorrow. Well, now, shall we see you all down in the harbor if the weather is fine? 9.30, perhaps? We will have the dinghy waiting at the quay. Splendid, father moved with him out into the hall, and everyone straggled after them. On the way, Polly Withers passed, or paused, and looked up over Simon's head at the old Cornish maps hanging among the oil paintings on the dark wall. Do look, Norman. Aren't they marvelous? She turned to mother. This really is a wonderful house. Did your uncle rent it from a friend? A Captain Toms. We've never met him. He's abroad, quite an old man, a retired sailor of some kind. I believe his family have owned the gray house for years. A fascinating place, Mr. Withers was looking about him with a professional eye. He, he has some beautiful old books, I see. He reached one hand idly down to the door of a long, low bookcase in the hall, but it would not open. I keep everything locked, Father said. You know what it is with a furnished house. One's always nervous of damaging things. An admirable principle, Mr. Withers said formally, but his sister was smiling down at Simon. I bet it's a wonderful place to explore, though, isn't it? She said. Have you children been looking for secret tunnels and things yet? I know I should have done, <coughs> I should have done in an old house. Do let us know if you find one, Simon said politely, feeling Barney's anxious eyes on his back. Oh, I don't think there's anything like that here. Well, till tomorrow, then, Mr. Withers said from the doorstep, and they were gone. Isn't that terrific, Barney said eagerly, when the door closed. A whole day out on the yacht? Do you think they'll let us help sail her? Mind you keep out of their way until you're asked, said Father. We don't want any casualties. Well, you could be, be ship's doctor. I'm on holiday, remember? Why didn't you tell us you'd met, met them, demanded Simon. I was going to, Father said meekly. I expect I was too busy being irritable, he grinned. You can let Rufus out now if you want to, Barney, but he's not going on the boat tomorrow, so don't ask. Jane said suddenly, I don't think I will either. Well, for goodness sake, Simon stared at her. Why ever not? I should get seasick. Of course you wouldn't. Not under sail. There won't be any smelly old engine running. Oh, come on, Jane. No, said Jane, more firmly. I'm not batty about boats like you are. I really don't want to go. They won't mind, will they, father? Simon said in disgust, you must be nuts. Leave her alone, said his father. She knows her own mind. No, they'll understand, Jane. No one want, would want you to be worried about getting ill. See how you feel about going in the morning, though. I do think it would be safer not, Jane said. But she said nothing about her real reason for not wanting to go. It would have, would have sounded too silly to explain that she felt a strange uneasiness about the tall white yacht and about the smiling Mr. Withers and his pretty sister. The more she thought about it, the sillier it seemed so that in the end she convinced herself, as well as everybody else, that her reason for avoiding the trip was nothing but fear of seasickness. But again, nobody knew where Great Uncle Mary had gone.